Chris, thank you so much for doing this. And we're so sorry that you couldn't join for the live event, but we really appreciate you recording your session with us as some bonus material for all of our amazing participants. Um, Good to be here. For those for those that don't know Chris, which I'm sure everybody does, Chris is the VP of Partnerships at Crossbeam, which is a very important software, account mapping software that we all, all of us in partnerships are pretty much using now <laughs> days. And also one of the founders of Partnership Leaders. Um, Chris, thank you so much for being here. And I'll just kind of let you take it away. Um, I do have a few questions for you. So Wonderful. would you like me to start with those or? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and thank you again for, for letting me be part of this. Uh, it's a great, a great topic and uh, sad I'm not live with everybody, but glad we could do this. Yes. And yeah, we're wishing you all the best with the hurricane. Please be safe. <laughs> Um, so the, yeah, the big topic here, you know, you're kind of, we're, we kind of uh, pitted you against Will Taylor um, on this one. You know, he's kind of taking the the pro um, or I guess the the con against tech um, in some ways, not completely, but um, you're taking sort of the pro tech route with this. And I think the biggest question for us is how do you think automation and software has changed partnerships? What have you seen in your experience? Yeah, I, th I think so like contextually where we're at right now, if you think about software development, so much energy was spent in, in the early 2000s on marketing automation, marketing efficiency and attribution, and then sales had their time in the, in the, in the sun. There's a ton of sales tech now out in the market and there's customer success has had a tremendous burst of activity. And, and of course, engineering has always had a lot of tools because engineers like to build things for themselves. Um, but partnerships has historically like that, you know, we had a lot of channel tech developed um, through the 1990s and 2000s, um, but not as much of that technology was built as, as like an inward facing, like to help the partner managers themselves do their job better. Um, and a lot of it was like more external facing uh, to help partners engage with a tech company or get the enablement and certification and deal registration they needed. So a lot of the PRM solutions, I think what's happening now is you're seeing a burst of activity where there's companies that are creating workflow automation and, and QBR type software for partnerships. So Calabi comes to mind or Superglue, which is doing some really fascinating stuff with like creating workflows for automation to really just like help the partner teams actually do things in a more automated fashion so they don't have to spend as much time doing the very manual processes that are involved with being a partnership professional right now. So I think like the reality is, is I think most partner people get into partnerships because they love working with other people and making them successful, but we're mired in this world of like dealing with Google Sheets and, and Google Docs because there's not been as much refinement around the processes and software for running partnerships at a modern SaaS company. I think that's like the big thing that's happening. So it's a really interesting and exciting time because you have these entrepreneurs that are a lot of times former partner professionals breaking off and creating these new companies to solve some of these problems. Um, but you also have this macro level kind of shift happening where the go-to-market teams for a lot of companies, especially in the software world, are realizing how vitally important partnerships are for influencing the entire customer life cycle. So um, it's, it, as I said before, it's, it's, it's a damn good time to be in partnerships and it's like <laughs> increasingly true uh, because we see more and more that the world is orienting around trying to help solve making partner teams more uh, efficient and effective at what they do. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's so interesting that you say that there's so, so many people that are sort of breaking off, becoming CEOs that used to work in partnerships and seeing how that is really, I mean, it's sparking this whole other kind of movement around SaaS and partnerships because from the from Jump Street, you have that CEO, like top level buy-in because they know they've seen the power of partnerships. Yeah, it's, I think the the investment, um, it is, you know, Crossbeam was fortunate to be able to get quite a bit of uh, venture capital money to help us grow. Um, Reveal is out there, of course, in the market, also doing some good stuff. There is a lot of focus right now on, especially kind of the account mapping and kind of programmatic data side of partnership information. Um, but there's also pretty large valuations for uh, some of the PRM solutions. And so I think like we've in essence created this moment in time where a lot of VCs are very intrigued at what's happening in this space, which is creating air cover for entrepreneurs to go and actually create new businesses in this category. Um, 
Um, so it's, uh, again, it's, it's just a really interesting time for us. Great. Yeah. Um, so coming sort of back to the, the root of this, this topic, this webinar, um, you know, yeah, we're seeing so many programs be able to sort of lighten their load, um, with automation, with all of the different tech that's out there to be able to kind of, you know, really streamline these processes, but we also see that sometimes that doesn't work well. And I'm, I'm wondering from your experience, where does the human component play into automate things like automation and tech? So it's, I think this is an interesting one, especially for teams that are just building their partner programs. There's a desire sometimes to mimic what has already happened in the market. And so a lot of times people will spend a lot of energy in that first six months in the role being like, okay, I need to create a partner program with multiple tiers, my bronze, silver, and gold and try to like make it as efficient as possible for, for me as the partner person to work with a lot of partners. And I think we can absolutely lose the human element component of working with these partners because things are changing. Like in, in the traditional channel world, you would have a transactional partner that was heavily involved in the point of sale. So it might've been a reseller or a distributor. Um, and now there's this sort of realization that we as partner teams need to be managing partners across this whole customer life cycle. And one person could be influencing at the beginning of the sale. Another partner could be influencing, you know, services that get wrapped around the deal to help with retention. There's all these different flavors of different partner types. And so if we're too prescriptive early on with like lining up the requirements, um, of our partner program, which also to some extent should just be turned around and called benefits. Um, you know, like I think the there's a lesson there of like spend time actually understanding what creates value for your partners. And it may not be the things that you think it might be. Like increasingly a lot of it partners in the services world don't care as much about the referral fee. They want to wrap those value added services around your technology, which could be orders of magnitude, more value for them. So are you designing your partner program to accommodate for that is something that really helps build empathy with your partners so that you're not, you just like over indexing on some highly structured and flexible program early on. Right. So it sounds like the human component is more like less in sort of the day to day, like processes that are being automated. Like we, it's more about making sure that the structure of the program itself, like is built to in mind that it's going to be flexible from, from the beginning. Is that correct? I think that that's the approach I've, I've personally taken at, at Crossbeam is like, we don't have tiers to our partner program today. Like mm -hmm. we invest energy, we have some requirements around like, like, how do you want to work with us? And we kind of figure out like, do we have the bandwidth to prioritize working with them at that, at this moment in time. But I think like we sort of orient around like, Hey, is, um, you know, are, are the things that you care about as a technology partner or a solutions partner, which we are our term for the channel, um, does that line up with like what we need to get done and, and, and the value that you can provide? And so like we we're keeping everyone sort of on the same level to some extent from a tiering perspective until we start to get repeatability around like, oh, OK, when somebody does this, this and this, they they, they get a ton of success. Um, and like the funny thing that happens right now is as long as you're doing good work with somebody and you're creating value for them and you you know the value they're looking for, they're going to continue leaning in. And ultimately, you're going to see the scoreboard go up from a revenue perspective of either sourced or influenced deals. Um, and so I think like having that flexibility has been quite helpful, I think. Um, I also, you know, to your question of like, where's the automation happening? I think there's there's a huge opportunity, especially because there's a lot of like army of one type of partner professionals out there, like go a go talk to peers about how they're automating various components of like the partnership life cycle, whether that's vetting new partners or supporting them with enabling content. There's a lot of technology we can use off the shelf, even that our own go to market team uses. Um, so partner enablement is a good example where like you could carve out a section of high spot for, um, you know, enablement content for your partners, or, you know, you can go and use some of the marketing automation stuff and bring partner data into it to make yourself not have to go and ask an AE every time you see some new, uh, collaboration opportunity. Like think about ways that you can be a force multiplier where you're not the single point of actually like making things happen. Um, because all these other departments around you could be collaborating with partnerships 
They just need to be oriented the right way with the data stream and the guidance on how you, you know, you want to go to market with them. I think that's like, again, this is one of those really interesting things because partnerships used to be off in the corner, so, sort of doing their own thing with resellers and stuff. And now it's like the partner team at a, at, a, at, a, at a SaaS company really should be servicing product, marketing, sales, customer success all around the business, which is why I always try to advocate that we roll up into the CEO is because we, we shouldn't be pigeonholed under one specific department. Um, so if you can sort of activate collaboration with all these other departments and build kind of workflows and things with all of them, like the amount of impact you can make, even as one partner person can be pretty substantial. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It reminds me of a conversation I had with Adam Pesh once that he said, there's like no goals that are just mine as a partnership leader. All my goals have to do with sales, marketing and product. So yeah, that's there great. You go. Yeah, <laughs> I hundred percent agree. If, if you can yeah. get the OKRs for the other departments to help you serve the things you need to get done, like that's organizationally how we can really uh, move more quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. And you kind of already answered this for me, but I think I'm going to frame this in just a little bit of a different way. I wanted to ask you originally, what are some things that people could do today, like starting today? to sort of find the balance between automation and um, and that human connection with partnerships. But I think you sort of already answered that for folks that probably already have a little bit more buy-in for their comp like with their companies, with other departments. So what would be your advice, that same question, but for partnership folks that are maybe struggling to get the buy-in to collaborate with other departments at this point? Yeah, so the question is kind of like, how do you show the value of, of, of partnerships or early on kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I guess, um, I guess the question is, you know, is there a way using technology, say like Crossbeam, for instance, um, to, while you're simultaneously sort of trying to make these human connections, build these partnerships, um, take some load off of you find, you know, by automatic auto automating these tasks, um, and then turn around and use maybe the data um, to help get that buy-in from your different departments. Um, is there anything that you can speak to around that particular pain point? Yeah, I mean, I'll give, give a good example of kind of drinking our own champagne here at Crossbeam. So when we look at a new partnership, we of course use Crossbeam to like figure out what are the overlaps with that partner from a mutual customer perspective? And if it's like, say, a technology partner that has the potential to do an integration with us, we'll use Crossbeam at m multiple moments during that sort of like partner life cycle. So right up front, do we even have that many overlaps in general that we can do stuff together? And that's like a good signal of like, should I spend time here? Uh, or at least what's the friction on us spending time together? Um, and then once we agree, like philosophically, we should be working together. There are some opportunities we can like low hanging fruit wise, go get people to potentially use this integration. Then we get into use case identification, um, which this is like another place where there's a lot of stuff happening in Google Sheets and stuff. But um, I've been working a lot with Collabi on like a tech partner onboarding sequencing um, where we can like lay out all the steps of, of what we want to do with our tech partners. Um, and like this like literally didn't exist like six months ago kind of thing. So that's how quickly this space is changing. Um, but you can like lay out kind of a process flow with these partners. And then once you have the use case, go back, talk to those using Crossbeam, talk to those mutual customers, figure out if those use cases from an integration perspective make sense, get the thumbs up, go into development, get the integration built, and then go back into Crossbeam when you actually try to do the go to market motion to get beta customers using that integration. So we're like, we're kind of weaving back in and out of these account mapping solutions, whether it's Crossbeam or something else that allows you to like spend very little time on the actual like customer identification component and much more time on like the actual conversations with those customers to, to like validate that they see value in you plus some other partner working together. Um, and then once that, that integration is launched, and this is where like the really sophisticated teams even small teams could have like massive impact. Take that partner data for those mutual customers and pump that into ABN campaigns, pump that into email marketing solutions, pump that into in-app notifications. Like the efficacy of, of, of those messaging campaigns to those customers is understandably quite high because it's incredibly targeted. And so that's the thing, like army of, you know, I'm an army of two, thankfully over here at Crossbeam with two partner <laughs> people, but, um, 
even if I wasn't here, or if Chris, uh, the other Chris wasn't here, like we could very easily take that list of B2B accounts and pump that into these marketing technologies and give that to the marketing team because it's just a list of B2B accounts. It's not super sophisticated and, and, and you know, it's not it's not something the marketing team doesn't know what to do with. Um, right. And so you can go and, and as long as you have the same kind of goals with the marketing organization, they can help you be a massive uh, accelerator to engage with a lot of these customer accounts. So I think that's like, if I think about the efficiency gain of the combination of the account mapping stuff, plus all the automation, once you have that programmatic partner data, that's just on the marketing side. You can of course do this also with sales as well, where you're feeding the sales organization a signal of where they could be collaborating. That stuff is just like very valuable. Um, it's so it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, this is not me just trying to pump up like what Crossman is doing, but like it literally changes how we operate as partner people when we use these types of things effectively. And then you tack on all the other innovations happening in the partner tech space right now. And we can just get so much more done so we can spend time on that human component of making sure the partners are happy, which for a lot of us, we don't, we, we get that, we get to do that a fraction of the time that we actually want to. Yeah. Yeah. Like you were saying in the beginning, it's people get into this business for that, but then get just that pile on of everything that takes away from it. So yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing, Chris. And I just wanted to see if there's any last like pieces of advice, any last, um, you know, insight that you think around this partic particular topic, people really need to know. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> the only last thing I would say is uh, be humble, engaging with your partners and go in and like really do good discovery on like what they're trying to get to um, and help them in some cases, especially channel partners may not actually have spent a lot of time with tech companies. And so helping them pattern match what success could look like working with a tech company is sometimes a really valuable exercise. Um, so I think just like be inquisitive and, and, and go and learn what the partners need so you can be really empathetic with, with them. That's great advice. I think that's true of, of any job really. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much for that. Um, well, that's all I had. Thank you so much, Chris, for your time and for sharing this insight with us. And um, we hope you all enjoy it and it will be available very soon for you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Bye. it.